Welcome to an episode of uh, Making It Happen with Tom Haney. Now, I've got a really inspiring chap. I've known him now a good number of years. And the whole point of this podcast is to help you uh, maybe get inspired, get an idea, um, have it, have more confidence, knowing that if they can do it, why can't you? And it might give you some ideas on what you can do to ne- the next step. Or just, just think, you know what, what an awesome chap or chapess that person is. And that gives you just some inspiration in life. So um, I've got the privilege to have Robbie in my own home. Thanks for coming down. And um, we met just through networking. And so I'm, I'm a businessman. He's a businessman. But we all have different chapters in our life. So in this uh, interview and chat, I just want to delve into the world of Robbie, find out how he ends up where he is, and then just get some maybe some top tips or some advice on if people are going to mirror or want to follow in his footsteps, what would they do too? So welcome to my home. Yeah, thanks for having me. And it's Christmas. It is Christmas. Robbie yeah. says he doesn't really celebrate Christmas in his house. I think he said bar humbug. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, yeah, something like that. <laughs> so um, the reason I want Robbie here is just because you know you you actually did something awesome for the country, and that means you made a commitment to actually serve to to protect the UK. And not everybody a has the the balls to do that, uh, but also the the actually commitment or or skill to be able to really be on the front line. So he uh, he'd been in the Marines. Yeah. And then leaving the Marines, you then set up a really successful business and you've managed to exit that business and, and sell it for five and a half million quid. And and so for me, I mean, there's some awesomeness in that. And I want to delve into how come you, how, you know, if you're awesome just by those stats, mm-hmm. um, but he's just like you and I'm just like you. So how did he make that happen? So let's delve right back. So when did you join? How did you end up in the Marines? Well, I think it was more of an accident, really. I mean, I was, you know, from a small sort of uh, farming village, and it was either when you leave school, you go work on the farm or work in the local woodyard or whatever. And uh, by chance, the school had sent us on a on a one week sort of uh, taster session with the Marines down, not the Marines, the Navy down in Portsmouth, and it was really good. It was, you know, it was away from home. You were doing outdoor activities, lots of sport. There was lots of things you could do, and I thought oh, I'll give this a try. And so I, I just applied to join the Navy and I literally left school and went straight in. Um, so did you know that you were end, going to end up in the Marines or did you just get, did you, did you make the decision to join the Navy because of just the fact that it, it met the activities, it was fun? I it just, just seemed, didn't have a clue yeah. what I wanted to do uh-huh. when I left school. I had no idea. I mean, I thought about being a teacher, about an architect, this, I had all these different ideas and I just couldn't settle on one. And uh, Going to university wasn't something anybody in our family did. Mm-hmm. We just, it was all just, we're all workers or we'd set up businesses. Our uncles had quite a lot of businesses. So that 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 seemed a bit too far away for me at that, at that age, at 16. I just want, I just wanted to get a job and, yeah. and uh, get some money coming. So the Navy, I thought, well, that sounds a great way to do it. And I was, I was accepted. And then once I got in, I basically played sport all the time. I mean, I had a job, but I was very rarely at my desk or doing stuff. I was either way playing rugby, boxing judo any sport I, I did fencing i did any sport that came along just sounds nice so you get paid to just have a, yeah, have a nice it was time great. yeah this was in the, the days long before the defense cuts when uh-huh. when, when you, you were allowed to get away and do these sort of things uh i managed to train with the, the field gun crews you know that used to run at earl's court and, and all these sorts of different um, great, what an experience you know i never I, and it, it was just a great sort of life but when i was i was on the navy boxing team and we were surrounded by there was a lot of marines on the team and they actually were full-time training. And uh, I thought, I want to join the Marines so I can be full-time training in boxing. Uh, I applied to join the Marines, got in, and then I never boxed again. So uh-huh. it was like, you know, but I still played a lot, an awful lot of sport. I played, rug- I played rugby for the Marines and, and different things and other sports. But rugby was, was the main sport that I was really uh, into. Now, a lot of people listening uh, might be able to relate to the fact that when you're a youngster or you're about to leave school, you have no idea really what you want to do. And you're almost a little lost lamb. I can completely relate to that. And so you, you were making the decision purely based on the fact that it met the needs of that. Like, you like to do sport. Yeah. And the idea of a career it wasn't really in your thought process. It was oh, yeah, more like... Before we had three square meals a day. Yeah, and structure yeah. and routine. Yeah. And so people, like, it's almost like quite... I a, think because I was in boarding school, it was, in a, it was quite a structured environment anyway. Mm-hmm. It actually set you up to, to, to go into that structured environment, you know. So, you know, the fact you, you became a Marine at 18 uh, is, is actually uh, is a, is a quite an... Uh, this must be quite a scary thought because there's some of the things you've been placed in at 18. Uh, how, how did you cope and, and did you were you ready for it at 18? I don't think it entered in my head. I think you're so carefree and, you know, sort of crazy at that age that 
Well, I certainly was. You just, you just didn't think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, as you get older, then you start to realize, bloody hell, these blocks shooting back. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so it, it, it's like, you know, it it doesn't. You think yeah, you can take on the world when you're 18. You know, so it didn't really enter my head. I didn't sort of think, oh, I'm a bit scared here. You know, even when, like I said, we went to Northern Ireland, working on the in the troubles over there on the streets of Belfast. It didn't really entertain you, you know, that, that, that there was any sort of trouble. You just, it was your job, you just went and did it. So, you, what, you were in the Marines for what, 11 years, 11 and a half years? In the time with the Navy and the and the Marines combined, it was about 11 and a half years. Okay, wow. So, in that time, then, let's say in the Marines, um, was there any particular vivid vivid events that happened that maybe you sort of want to share, like a good story or a, uh, just a, I think an experience? I think just going back to Northern Ireland, the only one that really sticks in my head, I mean, it was, I've been out. Uh, Nearly thirty years, so yeah. it, there's a lot of the memories of God. Yeah. Um, but one stuck sticks in my head where we we were actually patrolling uh, in uh, the Crumlin Road prison in Belfast, which is right opposite the law courts. And we had gone in to see the detachment sergeant, and he sat us down and gave us a, de- a briefing about you know how how to go about in the prison. And he said there is plastic explosives and there is weapons in the hands of Gosh. the prisoners. And I I was very <laughs> Just over, I was well, nearly nineteen or something like that, and you think so. That was a sort of wake up call. But it, like you say, look, I didn't. It didn't really scare. It was all just went oof. You know, I didn't uh-huh. really go. I'm, I'm frightened of that. But you just you were aware because mm-hmm. we had weapons as well. So at least it was we had a trade off. It's mm-hmm. not like we had, didn't have a means to fight back. But it it was quite a little on reflection. It's quite a scary. Yeah, thought. now you're getting older. Now I'm getting and, older. I'm and, thinking, oh, great. Yeah, I think no. your values change. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so somebody who's listened to this, maybe actually they might listen to this because they they they've seen that you were a marine and you've been in the navy, and they're wondering is the is it the right thing to do for them? So, if if you could give any advice or even just a word of warning or a tip. Uh, anything to you if uh, let's say it was your son saying, "Dad, I'm thinking about joining the navy." What would you be saying to them? As a, uh, and this might sound funny, but you, when if you do go in, you'll get it. Learn to iron. All right. You know what I'm saying that. If well, I'll you, definitely not get in. If you can't iron, <laughs> if you can't iron, you're you're gonna have so much trouble with your kit, yeah. and you're gonna be in so much. But it's you know looking after your kit, especially with the, the Marines, was even harder on it than than the Navy. But Can you hire somebody to iron for well, you? Because yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, that's what I would want to do. <laughs> but, no, but you seriously have to look after your kit, and yeah. uh, that that's the one thing. And on a more serious note, it's it's. It's get physically prepare yourself. Mm-hmm. One for for the for the you know whether it's the Marines or the Navy or the Air Force, but get physically prepared to go in because it'll make it easier once you are in. But uh, also, when, so when you say physically prepared, what do you mean by that? Uh, running, fitness, you know, upper body weight, strength, you know, because yeah. you've got to climb ropes, you've got to carry packs, you've got, to, you know, so especially these days where a lot of children don't really do a lot of exercise mm-hmm. and. and you find the day they either really do a lot of sport or they do none. There's no in between. Uh-huh. So if you played rugby or something, like that, you've probably got a head start because you're used to that sort of uh, intensity. But um, so you need to. It's physically prepare yourself. But the next thing is is to actually think long and hard before you sign on the line and speak to people that have been in because it's actually not for everybody. And and it's you see the brochures and you see. You know, you get this amount much leave, you get this many benefits, you get this amount of pay. But like I said earlier, jokingly, they actually they actually are firing back. Yeah. At some point. Yeah, the, the reality. The reality is that you know you could end up dead or yeah. you could end up injured or you know, you've seen people come back from war zones with lost limbs. Thankfully, you haven't. Yeah. yeah. You've seen people with PTSD. There's a lot. There's there's a reported every week. There's a suicide nearly every week mm. from from. From for veterans, so. yeah, that's a really important point you made. So, uh, so the whole uh, the mental health has always been around. It's yeah. just that now it's it's much more. I think it's more talk about it. because people yeah. are, are. I think with the advantage of social media, people are put they, they put out their stuff and they, I'm struggling or whatever, and it's like that's mm. like they they the modern cry for help. Yeah, you know they, they'll stick a post up on social media or whatever, or they'll they'll make it known that way, and um. And also, it, it may have been happening in the past, but now we can get statistics very quickly at the push of a button. You know, a friend of mine set up uh, Veterans Against Suicide. Yeah. It's, it's basically a Facebook page and a blog or whatever. Okay. And, like, they report things, in, and they'll, they'll say, somebody might put a post up, I'm struggling this week. So, bang, they'll, they'll dispatch somebody to his home. And okay, and great. Oh, a great so service. So, it's a great little thing, but that never happened in the past. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it's still 
you see every week there's another one gone there's another one mm. taking his life you know all this sort of so let's so, you know the, the marines when you're if you're placed in a really stressed environment um how how did you cope with that because it, you know it's not some people would really struggle with that the fact that they you know their life is is at risk and you know uh, and you are controlled like you, you're told when to sleep when to eat and some people would love that but um you know, how how, uh, how did you cope with that um the, the fact that you're always uh, at risk when you uh, well the, the only the only time I, was, I personally felt really at risk was in northern ireland mm-hmm. so the rest yeah. of the time it was pretty laid back i was either in barracks i was playing sport or i was on training courses or whatever sometimes you probably felt more at risk when you're trying to do some of the training courses because some of the stuff that you're doing it was quite yeah. scary yeah but from a a threat point of view from an it was northern ireland and to be honest i didn't even think about it yeah so i, I, I just you know you do, i think you were so busy getting your kit ready sleeping get training and all these sorts of things getting yourself mm. prepared doing your your admin your in your work that time just flew but you didn't have time to, to worry about yeah like that, you know and, and if, I, if a call <clears throat> came you know like some incident went off and you had to run into a jeep and go out and do it you just did it yeah you didn't sort of run stand at the back and oh, i'm not going today mm-hmm. i can't be bothered you know so but it's not until later when you reflect on it when you're a bit older you think oh crazy I won't do that again. Yeah. So then, so moving from um, military life into civilian life, a lot of people, you know, you said about PTSD and people, there's like lots of um, there's high suicide risk with people transitioning from out, out of uh, military life. Um, so you know, let's just delve into that slightly. So you know, I, I'm not I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. It's just it's a, it's, a, it's a thought that one reason people maybe struggle is because they're so structured. They taught when to sleep, when to eat, like the structure of the day. They have a purpose because they're serving. Um, they, they are, they, they're achieving because there's like lots of competition. There's lots of investment, and then they move into civilian life and they've lost all that. And it's a bit they feel lost. Uh, and so it's um, how 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 can we? Because I mean, you seem to be well. You set up a business. You're massively successful from that uh, compared to so many people. So how how did you cope with that that la- like that lack of structure and and so talk us through how well did, I, like, I the think basically I created a structure because I I'd set up my my first gym three months prior to actually leaving the Marines. Mm-hmm. Now I was I was basically on leave but getting paid, but I actually set the gym up. Yeah. So I started the gym in the January and I didn't leave till the sort of April. You know. Mm-hmm. The, Late did you have a plan or did it just was it just winging no, it go feeling I, I, I had a plan to open the gym mm-hmm. and, it, and it went along well but yeah so when you set up a small business you're so busy i was up at like five o'clock in the morning i was painting the, the gym out i was painting yeah. the equipment i was refurbishing benches you know carpeting places painting, can, yeah, you I know can. everything that goes with setting up when you you didn't have time to get stressed or worry about it you know like, you just had to get on with it you know and, like uh, any business you know ultimately you committed aren't you it's yeah, like yeah. massive action commitment just absorbs your life just to yeah. get it going but so, the byproduct is like um how long like 25 years 25 years later yeah well, you, like, you, you sell and, the businesses that you're involved in for but like people say you know it's all roses and, but i was actually sleeping on the gym floor for, mm-hmm. for, for a certain period uh-huh. of time and like you know, sleeping in, in the change rooms and when the gym was shut and all this, no, I, I, I couldn't afford to live anywhere. Yeah, and it was. It, but then it, you, it built up and built up. You know, so, um, and I think them sorts of sacrifices makes it. You have to make them. And, and, it makes it more worthwhile in the end, you know. When yeah, because a lot of people just are always looking for the 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 quick fix, the golden yeah, gem yeah, that makes them a, a millionaire overnight, and that the reality is it doesn't happen. It's not, it, it, yeah. What what annoys me a little bit about the modern way that this crowdfunding and youngsters set the oh, I want so much I want somebody to invest and they want a, they want a million pound given them to go and throw out some sort of thing that's like you know stick it up in the wind and see if it works but yeah uh, I think it's the grind and the sort of st- struggle and the challenge that's what mm. makes it better along with you've actually achieved something as opposed to somebody saying there's a million pound yeah either make it work or, or you'll blow it you know so why then so why would you say you enjoyed being in business rather than just taking another job? Um, I, I'm I'm not against authority, but in any street, I, I, I'm I'm quite I can quite I can take authority, but I just I thought I just wanted to do something for myself. Mm-hmm. It's not that I didn't want, and I you'd been in the Marines in this way, you somebody telling you what to do from the minute you woke up till the minute you went to bed, and I think I think it was just in you. Mm-hmm. To, it's I think it was just in me to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, I get that. I, I, I don't. It's I didn't, fire. I didn't, that... I didn't really sort of. 
know, when I was 16, I never thought, of being, I was talking to this my son last, he said, Dad, I, I, I'm enjoying me, I'll never be a businessman. I said, don't say that and mm. never say never <clears throat> because I was like exactly like that at your age. Says, and then 10 years later, I was a businessman. I said, so you just yeah, don't know don't what's know. around the corner. I said, I said to him, you were going to be a ballet dancer when you were 12. And yeah. He said, no, you're a welder. I said, don't, <laughs> don't make any decisions. Yeah about your future I want to right. be a sit on grass cutter when I was that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so you know it, it's it was just I think it's just in you going back to the entrepreneurship uh-huh. to my uncle had a scrap yard my uncle had a fruit shop mm. my grandfather was a farmer my other uncle was a builder you know so there was a history of, of people in the family being businessmen so yeah um, and I think that I think probably my uncle having the scrap yard I used to hang around that scrap yard as a kid you know, taking scrap and turning it into money, you know, it was that was my wife says it's still in me. I'll find <laughs> something and you know, I'll make some money out of it somehow. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's just in you. So how did you end up um having a caravan um site after well, from setting up a gym? Well, Tell well, us my, about that transition. My, my business I had a silent partner in in the in the health clubs and gyms that we set up and uh, he had a caravan park mm. and I was getting more and more involved helping him with his admin and his marketing and sales and all sorts of stuff like that and as as i sort of sort of the gym started you know getting a bit old hat and they weren't really i wasn't getting as much enjoyment out of it and um they were you know they were making money but they weren't you know think this is not going to make me millionaire or whatever you know um I, st- I started looking at the caravans thinking i'm missing a trick yeah this is a, actually a very good business yeah and um i sort of plowed in and got stuck into it and, it's uh, interesting you're saying you were doing the business and you started thinking this isn't going to make me um uber or much more wealthier and yeah. so you start on making decisions and you start looking out in yeah. terms of opportunities to get it because that's an important factor isn't it when you're starting a business it's actually start at the outcome yeah um so so tell so you started looking for opportunities like this yeah and well it, i wouldn't say i looked for it it just fell into my lap i was okay. basically there anyway and mm. i was helping them out and i, I, I just sort of as I was doing the numbers and doing, I'm thinking this is a lot easier than working 12 hours from nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night in a gym. Yeah. Um, and along, alongside running the gym, I was working in professional rugby as a fitness coach. So mm-hmm. I was doing all these hours trying to, you know, do make ends meet. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking I can sell a caravan for X amount of pounds and make more money out so of one caravan than yeah. I can in a month. <laughs> yeah. In a gym, you know. Yeah, so. but, but I suppose though, that's, that, that is a key thing, though, that you're doing, though, is you're, you're seeing opportunity or something. So yeah. you, you've met somebody, you, you're seeing how you can help them, yeah. and then you're seeing how, you, how, how there's an opportunity. And so I know you said, oh, it was a, it was a bit of luck, but actually, if you drill back, well, yeah, it's more I mean, of your attitude you've and you're just see, that you, you, commitment. To you've just, got to be able to see the, the opportunity yeah, as well. You know, some, that's the thing. As other people were in that situation and they didn't see it. Yeah, mm. I, I grabbed it with both hands and ran with it. Yeah. So joint ventures, for example, like I do joint ventures as well, and it's a great way to scale because you 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 you're, you're leveraging the ability of someone's skill set and opportunities and uh, and just attitude. And it's, and business can be boring on your own and lonely. So um, tell me about the joint ventures then. So what 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 some of the challenges that can come from having joint ventures? Well, it's, it's deciding who does what, yeah. you know, who's responsible for what. But the great thing I learned about, um, and my, my accountant pointed this out to me once, I never go into business with somebody with the same skills as you. Yeah, it's very important. Now, and because people will look at me and my business, but I'm now 53 and Lance is now 72. Mm-hmm. But we're like two peas, in, we're not like two peas, we're like chalk and peas. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Totally different. Well, I've met Lance, yeah. Totally he's a great chap. Uh, outlooks on life, totally different views on lots of things, but he's very good. With dealing with accountants, solicitors, and uh, he members dates. He, he's very good with the finance side of things, and I'm more of the creative person and will take a risk. And he's very risk averse, and I'll try and let's do this, do that. So having them two opposite viewpoints, sometimes I'll charge ahead, but he might pull me back. You know, yeah. at certain times. That's important. And, and exactly, and, and the accountant said, you know, I can, when he said to me, he said, I see why this works now. Yeah. He said, I, d- I didn't get it at first, but I do now. Whereas there's more of a creative person, and it's like. When people could talk to me, oh, I want to open the gym, and that, that two gym instructors asking me for advice, I said, well, the two of you, one of you needs to stop being a gym instructor, and one of, one of you needs to start learning market and sales and advertising, yeah. or you need to bring somebody in, because if the, if the two of you just want to be gym instructors, you'll never get the rest of the work done, mm-hmm. that or you know, or trainers, that, that, that needs to be done to run that business, so 
I think that's that's a great thing when you're looking for joint ventures or partners. Yeah, yeah okay. and so um, so because so the benefit then joint venture with you've skilled a, a great business, and um, so you, you was in the caravan. So what was it? What was the some of the successes that you've made in the caravan world? Well, I think I think basically uh, when we got involved, you know, I won't give too many numbers away, but we basically quadrupled turnover in mm. the time. Um, great. And, and you know the rental income went up, and you had, that, that was the benefit of you coming on board. I think I hope I like to think so. You know? Yeah, from uh, some things it's true. Um, and then um, you know we, we kept um, the place was getting more turnover from the rent. That we could put the rates up because we were making better facilities. Uh, we were selling higher uh, priced caravans, you know, yeah. for value. Um, so yeah, and you know by the time we got to the point where we wanted to exit, we, we were. Uh, a good proposition would added value and you know we got a, a decent value f- f- for it. I think if we'd stayed maybe it's another couple of years we could have added even more value and made it but it mm-hmm. was just getting to the point do I want to keep going the, the place needed probably about a million pounds spent it do I want to keep going and reinvesting and reinvesting yeah. or do I w- want to take it now and would we have made it much more yeah, I don't know. Well, so what, what's what's interesting is so you've you've gone through the whole the transition of setting up a business, you've set up multiple businesses, you've joined joint ventures, and then you've exited a business. And many people who are listening, maybe they've never they actually sold a business. So you know, very succinctly, share with us like what what's some of the challenges or one one of the the key things to look out for. If let's say I was going to want to sell my business, what's some of the key things you would say like well, Tom, I'll look out for this? I'll tell you now. Yeah, I learned more about business <laughs> selling a business uh-huh. than I did running the business. Okay, that, tell me about that. Because you need to get all your ducks in the row before you even think about selling. Mm-hmm. You know, caravan parks that were were quite, were quite rich at the time for mm-hmm. being taken over. The bigger groups wanted to get a hold, so it was basically put up for sale, and we had inquiries and people coming. You know, and it was like, oh. Hold on, mm-hmm. you know you need to get your account sorted. You need to make sure you've got all the right uh, licenses in place. Everything's up to date. You know your your insurances and, and um, yeah. And with, with it being a caravan park, you need the environmental tests done on your, you know for your sewerage. And there's loads of mm-hmm. things that you know, to be checked before you go. And these things take time. Make sure the elect- electrics are tested. Yeah. You know, it's like when you sell a house, you get a server. We've got. It's so much complex. Our caravans all have to be electrically tested, yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. System needs to be sound, you know. So, so what about like? So how do they end up? How do you end up valuing that business? How 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 could you put a price on it? Well, it it, it, it goes on your on your profit, but also that's linked to this. They come up with the formula where it's the the cost of the rent per pitch times the amount of caravans times another figure, and that, that figure escapes me at the minute. It, 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 it's a formula like a, like a multiplier like yeah, a it's yield. a multiplier yeah, yeah. but it's, bit, it, it's it's linked to the profit but also about how many caravans you've got and how much rent that you can bring in from them yeah. caravans because mm-hmm. that's your baseline it income. sounds like similar to, to a commercial valuation on property then yeah, it might be yeah, yeah. so um, and it's a tried and tested formula that they've used Great. for years for, for value in caravan parks and then the land that will be a, a value for the land as well yeah. because it all depends how you sell it. We actually sold the land separate mm-hmm. from the business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that had to do with inheritance and that, tax and stuff like that. So that was so just advice from the professional that team. Just, that's just fantastic. So yeah, um, and I was learning all these things that I'd never heard about before, and um, so that opens your eyes mm-hmm. to um, a whole new field of business. Of all. selling a business is, is a totally different thing, and I, I have to say it taught me a lot of stuff. And is there a, is there a percentage that what, what's the cost of selling a business? Is it a, a, well, the, everybody wants a piece of the pie. You know, do, yeah. You've got uh-huh. your accountants, <laughs> you've got your solicitors, you've yep. got the land agent, you know, you've got valuers, mm-hmm. you've got you know, then you've got to speak to people about you know inheritance tax, yeah, but and then it's capital gains tax, corporation tax, all these all these taxes. Everybody wants a handout. So and believe it, you just make one stroke with a pen the wrong way. Or somebody doesn't get their fingers right, and you can lose an awful lot of money. Yeah. And it might not be then, but you know, two or three years later, we're still sorting out certain things regarding business partners, inheritance tax, and uh, corporation tax because it, it goes back for years. Mm-hmm. You have to claim back things because our caravan park was on a what they call a site of scientific interest, so it had we had set different capital allowances allowed on that. And there's another one, capital allowances for we, we built the restaurant on the you know there was money we could claw back mm-hmm. for that which we hadn't claimed which we then got back, which was highlighted when we did our 
yeah. accounts, you know. So there's, there's loads of pitfalls. Okay, so so you so you sold the business, uh, but the, um, but I mean you do charitable stuff. Uh, you've you've been volunteering for um, charities that are really close to your heart, yeah. and also you you now you're still being you're still being entrepreneurial because you know, do you think you're ever going to retire or like, what what's, what's the world look like now? You've sold that, that business um, with your joint partner for five and a half mil. Well, we have kept the holiday cottages and we've, we've added some properties to the portfolio over the last year or two, and hopefully that's where we're going to go now. Um, but didn't see why you should stop i think i've seen i've seen people stop and they're dead you know what i mean within years yeah. you know you, you i think you've just got to keep got to keep moving you've got to keep moving forward I, I don't think i don't want to get as deeply involved in having loads of stuff and having um that's your that's choice isn't it so, yeah well, I, I don't you've got so much choice going on right now big business anymore mm-hmm. i just a, a lifestyle business that we've got enough money in the bank to pay our mortgage off um and we've got a little business that we can grow Great. now yeah but without going but you're putting time into charities, so like you, you, you've been, you've been supporting like dyslexia char- charities, yeah, and, yeah. and so tell, tell us a bit more about like what you, what you're involved in in terms of what you're passionate about. Well, I, th- I think my life, it, it's, it's to be honest, it's the fitness thing that I keep getting dragged. But my wife yeah. did me wrong for doing, but I just I love my fitness and I love do, I go on, I still go on courses. I've just been to London on a course with my friend, and I, and I still keep reading about it and buying books about it and doing it. so. And I still work out a lot, so I'm 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 looking at even though we've got the property thing, I'm I might do another side hustle, which is something to do with the fitness industry, yeah. and I, I don't think it'll be a gym or anything like that because I've done that and I, I know I can I can do that standing on my head. Mm-hmm. And I, it's not really going to be a challenge. It's just open the unit, fill it with customers, yeah. and get them fit. But I think now I'm one of the things I'm really interested in is the recovery side of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, so for longevity, um, movement. Um, People getting better sleep, recovering better from training. Yeah. And there's, and there's, all, and there's all this uh, artificial intelligence stuff coming out that for, for heart rate monitoring and, and um, monitoring your sleep. To, and I think this sleep or lack of sleep is a big ep- epidemic at the minute yeah. in the country. There's too much blue light, there's too much screens, there's too much screen mm-hmm. time. And 90% of the people I speak to are struggling with lack of sleep. Yeah, and yeah I, I agree. And I'll, I'll take it back to when I was in the Marines. The first thing, if we want to stress somebody out, say we were doing, you know, had a prisoner or whatever, and we want to stress them out, all you do is keep them awake. Mm-hmm. Just, just rattle it. Exhaustion. Just, and you, you keep you keep somebody awake for 40 hours with no sleep, you'll yeah. get anything. They'll tell you anything. Wow. So this is, that shows you how bad lack of sleep is uh, yeah. in the modern day. And I think uh, recovery from, whether it's your work or your activities or your sport, I think that's something that I'm doing a bit of research at the minute that we might... That's exciting. Well, I look forward to following that with you. Yeah. Now, in terms of the, just to finish off then, so you've, you've set up multiple businesses, you've exited the businesses, and you've made a great amount of money, but you're also giving back to communities through your charitable work. If somebody was thinking, you know what, I, I, um, so we've talked about if somebody wanted to go into the, the, the Navy or the military, some of the thought process behind should what should they think about. If I was think. <coughs> If somebody was thinking, I've never had a business before, I want to get into it. If you were, if you were like, okay, think about X before you delve feet first in, what would you say? I think you've got to know, you've got to know your numbers. You've got mm-hmm. to know how much you actually want to earn. Yeah. You know, and start with the end in mind. So say you want 100,000, we'll start there and work back. Yeah. You know, 100,000 pound a year, it's eight grand a month. Mm. Yeah, a million pound a year, it's 80,000 pound a month. So how can you, how can I do it? I read a book about uh, if you made... Two and a half grand a day. That was a million pound day. A million, a million pound day. Uh-huh. So how many million pound days do you need? Yeah. To, to get you, you know, and then if you're not making that, well, what can you do? You got to change it. You got to change strategy. Yeah, because I suppose when you were saying that you had your yeah, gym business, but then actually you thought it's not going to make you the wealth that you wanted. So that's yeah. why, even subconsciously, when your opportunity arose with well, the yeah, you see, you stand there, and you're you were like, right, 12, there, there's the numbers. You're working twelve hours a day and yeah. you're making X amount of pounds. And you think, well, it's, it's all right. I was, I wasn't doing badly, but. Mm-hmm. I wasn't like getting to them it's not levels. Scalable, and, and yeah, to be honest, yeah. then you get to them levels, and and since you know I play a lot of golf, as you know, and and I and I'm mixing with some people. You still not invited me, by the way. Well, we will <laughs> and uh, I've started mixing with some people who have exited from business far, far in a larger scale than I have. Mm-hmm. And you're thinking, I thought I was doing okay, and I did. Don't get me wrong, but when you see they're doing twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred and fifty million exits, yeah, and you're thinking. 
that that's just madness to me. I, I actually can't get my head around that mm. sometimes. That that is a big business. You know? Yeah, and, I get that. Uh, so I, I think I know my level. You know that that and and but the you know I'm I'm a success compared to some people, but there's people. No, there's always somebody in the level. Yeah, but it's a totally different level. Yeah. So but what you're saying, they're busy doing numbers game and ultimately start of the outcome. What size business do you want, and do, will the business be able to scale to get to the level they really want? And, and I think a lot of them don't think of the exit either. Yeah. What is your exit strategy? Mm. Are, are you are you starting this business now? Yeah. And are you going to stay with it till you retire? Yeah. Or are you going to do ten years and exit? Are you going to do That's three important. years and exit? I agree. Yeah. You know some of these startups now that they've got them for three years and the exits boom they're out yeah, and brilliant. they've made so many millions and then they'll go in to some you know these mm. tech uh, guys you know so yeah um and and it's it's certainly the env- if i'll say one thing the environment now for starting a business has never been easier yeah brilliant. it is it, the the entry level and the the stuff you need you can you can start with a smartphone mm-hmm. if you're technology is fantastic so yeah. you know the, the the entry level i i it was hundreds of thousands of to start, you know, years mm. back, a gym would cost you hundred grand just for a basic setup. Yeah. Now you can go out and get it, the pe- it's pennies to buy yeah. gym equipment now, or, or or whatever you want. So, the the entry level is 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 lower down, and it's so much easier. But and also the tech you've got, like QuickBooks for accounting. Yeah, lower All startup these, costs. It's yeah. just it's just and phenomenal. It's great. So that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And so a young entrepreneur has never had a better time. Yeah. To start up, the, the challenges and the and the um, the barriers to entry is, is so much lower. So from from what you've said, then it just sounds like um, you, know, you, you the way you've lived your life is just by taking massive action constantly by by not just being complacent by being passive. You're you're very active and in control of the life that you've got. And it, it, maybe that's why when you left such a strict structured military life, you then moved into business because you, you kept building structure into your life and not not being a victim to to no structure or not a victim to <laughs> well, you well, seem to be so in control yeah, of what you're well, doing well my, my wife said i still lived in the barracks because <laughs> i had my house here yeah i had my gym here like yeah. a mile away the caravan park was half a mile over there the golf course was a mile over there she says you're yeah. still in your little barracks yeah uh, so i created a like your little uh, sort of safe but did you like, iron military style oh, I still, still do all the ironing. yeah i still do all the i've got a pal right here if you want if you get if you get if you run out <laughs> Well, it's been really, it's been great chatting with you. And um, if if you want to follow you, are you on social media? Yeah, it's just my name, Robbie Redpath. Yeah. I generally, Facebook's the main one I Fantastic. use. Fantastic. Uh, um, we have a website for our holiday company, uh, Bamber Breaks. That's the, you know, the sort of the website that we are. But um, and I, I don't really use any. I don't Twitter or whatever. Yeah, so you find them. You find them on I've got an account, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, it's been great, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Cheers, yeah. dude. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah.